The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Here now the word of the Lord as it is found in Judges chapter 13. Once again, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren, had no children. But an angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are a barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful. Drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me. His appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. Now I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then... Uh, no drink, no wine, no, uh, no strong drink shall pass your lips, and you shall eat nothing unclean, for the child is to be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And so it was that the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Manna Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In our survey of the book of Judges, we have come now to perhaps the most famous... And the most remarkable of all of the judges, Samson, the original superhero. (laughs) But as we will see, uh, being a superhero is not always what it's cracked up to be. Let's pray that as we examine this life, that we can not, not only see the important lessons for us from it, But let's pray that the Lord would show us in it our need for something more than a superhero. That he would show us our need for a savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, uh, for its power and its truth. We're grateful that it is without error, uh, that it uh, shines light in the darkness and beckons us to walk in the fullness of your goodness. Uh, We pray that you would now open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, Cecil B. DeMille was one of the founders of the art of the film. He started his career in silent pictures and uh, continued on all the way through to Academy Award winning uh, biblical epics like The King of Kings, The Sign of the Cross, and The Ten Commandments. Uh, But what you might not know is that his most successful film was not portraying Charlton Heston as Moses, uh, but rather uh, when he uh, portrayed Hedy Lamarr, uh, Victor Mature, And Angela Lansbury, in his great 1949 epic, Samson and Delilah. Hollywood would remake this uh, film uh, some three times, uh, but uh, but the uh, five Academy Awards uh, won uh, by uh, Cecil B. DeMille uh, set the standard. In fact... Now, you may not know this, but just this last week, Hollywood put out yet another Samson movie. 
And it's gotten terrible reviews. <laughs> it opened in some 1,250 theaters. It was put out by the uh, same production company that did The Case for Christ and God's Not Dead. It stars uh, such Hollywood stalwarts as uh, a Rutger Hauer as Manoa and uh, Lindsay Wagner, Wonder Woman, as, uh, as uh, Samson's mother, uh, Caitlin Leahy as Delilah, and Taylor James as Samson. He's portrayed, of course, as a superhero, uh, but he's a very flawed superhero whose kryptonite is way too easy to identify. Now, Arthur Kundal, in his commentary on the book of Judges, says this, about this flawed superhero. Endowed with the Spirit of the Lord and dedicated to a lifelong Nazarite vow, Samson's life seems to have revolved around illicit relationships with loose living women. Whilst he is said to have judged Israel for 20 years, he affected no real deliverance from the Philistines. And he perished as a prisoner in their midst. It is a sad tale of a lack of discipline and true dedication, and the reader is left wondering what Samson might have achieved had his enormous potential been matched and tempered by those mental and spiritual qualities that were required of him. The story of Samson uh, really has two very important background details uh, that we need to pay heed to before we look at the story itself. Uh, The first of those details is just the story of the Philistines. Uh, The Philistines throughout much of the Old Testament are portrayed as uh, the emblem of the world. that They represent fallenness, brokenness, brutality, godlessness. The the second thing uh, that we need to focus on is the Nazarite vow that Samson had from his childhood. Uh, The Nazarite vow uh, really represented separation from the world. It represented a call to holiness, particularly in a time of crisis. The Philistines uh, were a people who, uh, who were the quintessential enemy of God's covenant. Uh, they dwelt along the coastline just adjacent to the territory of Israel in, uh, in a coastal plain. They had been pushed south uh, by the Phoenicians from Tyre and Sidon, and they dwelt in five great cities, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. Interestingly, dwelling with the Philistines uh, were another ancient enemy of the Israelites. They they dwelt together and and they became one people. Uh, They were the Rephaim and the Anakim. We first run into the Rephaim and the Anakim in Genesis chapter 14 in the story of Abraham and his battle with Cheddar Laomer. You remember he and his 318 men chased Cheddar Laomer, the king of the Babylonians, right out of the land of promise. But dwelling in that land were these giants among men known as the Rephaim and the Anakim, as well as a whole host of assorted Uh, associated tribes, the Zamzumim and the Zumim and the Enim. And uh, and so we don't hear about them again until Numbers chapter 13. Uh, The people of Israel are about to come into the promised land. And so Moses sends spies out. And they come back with a a word that the land is flowing with milk and honey. And and the vines bear fruit as big as grapefruit. But there are giants in the land. 
And they make us feel like grasshoppers. Those were the Rephaim and the Anakim. But we're told in Joshua chapter 11 uh, that when Joshua and the various tribes began to reconquer the land, the Rephaim and the Anakim were still there dwelling along the coastal plain in cities like Gath and Gaza. And of course, we run across them again in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, when the Philistines, uh, arrayed for war against Israel, send out one of their champions, one of the sons of the Rephaim and the Anakim from the city of Gath, a champion named Goliath, to face down a small boy with five uh, smooth stones and a single sling. It doesn't turn out well. <clears throat> so the, uh, the, the whole picture here is of a kind of worldliness, a barbarity, and the enemy of God's people, these Philistines. The Nazarite vow, on the other hand, was a vow of special consecration to God and separation from the world. It was, um, it was a vow that was detailed in all of its requirements in Numbers chapter 6, uh, which described the Nazarite vow as a kind of setting apart of an individual to be something like a special temporary priest of God, particularly for times of crisis and for times of war. Uh, The Nazarite was to be completely devoted to God. In fact, the Hebrew word nazir literally means separated, called apart. We see the kind of separation in four particular aspects of the Nazarite vow. Uh, A Nazarite was to abstain uh, not just from all alcohol, but from grapes, from raisins, I would assume even from Welch's jelly. Uh, Secondly, he was not to cut his hair for the whole duration of his vow. Uh, Third, he was to abstain from all unclean things, including uh, approaching any corpse of animals or of men. And then finally, there were a whole series of special offerings uh, that, uh, that were to be made, uh, offerings that set the Nazarite apart but as devoted altogether to God. Now, these may seem a bit pe- uh, peculiar, uh, but, uh, but just kind of setting aside uh, the, the oddness of these vows, uh, James Jordan, in his commentary on the book of Judges, has this to say about the alcohol and grapes. He says this, in Leviticus 10... Uh, Priests were prohibited from drinking alcohol while serving in the tabernacle. Uh, The reason given is so that a distinction might be made between the holy and the profane, between the clean and the unclean. And so likewise, uh, the Nazarite is prohibited from drinking alcohol, from eating grapes, uh, from having raisins, for the same reason. Now, we might think that this means that alcohol is somehow uh, profane or unclean in itself. Uh, But actually, the reverse is the truth. It is because men are unclean that they are not allowed to relax with alcohol in the presence of God, letting down their guard. You see, in the Bible, uh, wine is for joy. Judges chapter 9, uh, Psalm 104. It is a picture of future blessings when the curse on the ground, thorns and brambles, is overcome by the vine. And as the vine flourishes, it produces the fruit. Thus, it has a very close tie in the Bible to the Sabbath, to that time when man's work is finished and he can finally rest in the presence of God. So why then, Jordan asks, 
was the priest forbidden to enjoy a little Sabbath wine in God's presence? And the answer is uh, that it was to show that the Aaronic priesthood was actually inadequate and that the Sabbath, the true Sabbath, had not yet come. It was a setting apart of the priest for the promise that was yet to come. And because the Nazarite was a temporary priest, he had a holy task to perform. Until he'd completed it, he was not to sit down and enjoy the Sabbath blessing of the fruit of the vine. In a similar way, the, uh, the, the business about the hair not being cut is directly related to this uh, the notion of the vine. You see, in the Bible, hair, flourishing hair, is a symbol of life, of vitality, of the blessing of God. I'm so sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> It's a part of the reason why in Leviticus chapter 25, uh, we have this peculiar comparison between the untrimmed vines, the grapevines, and a hair during the year of the Jubilee. Uh, the idea here, again, is to set apart, to be distinct from the world. And so the prohibition against unclean things and the special offerings, all of this was to make it clear that the Nazarite was to be as close to the holiness of God as a human being can possibly be. And he has all of these marks in his life to set him apart to this. This, by the way, is is why John the Baptist seemed to be so peculiar out in the desert. He lived the Nazarite vow. Uh, So, the whole background to Samson's story is really the contrast between the worldliness of the world, epitomized by the Philistines, and the call to a life of purity, consecration, and devotion, epitomized by the Nazarite vow. So, when we come to the story itself... Uh, we start to see how Samson, this extraordinary person with great strength and a glorious calling and a mighty purpose, always falls short. His uh, birth narrative is in chapter 13, verses 1 through 25. Manoah and his unnamed mother uh, are... uh, are in the grips of sorrow because of childlessness. And an angel of the Lord comes and appears and declares that they will bear a son and that he is to be set apart as a Nazarite and that he will begin to save his people from the hand of the Philistines. Almost immediately, Uh, We see that the Spirit of the Lord is on this child. He grows in strength, and the Spirit begins to stir him. The next scene that we have uh, comes in chapter 14 and and bleeds over into the first part of chapter 15. Uh, This is uh, the time of his marriage. In verses 1 through 4, we're told that he looked upon the Philistine women, and he saw a woman Uh, that he greatly desired. He told his father and his mother that she was right in my eyes. And so uh, they tried to persuade him that perhaps a more suitable match might be made among the daughters of the Danites or perhaps from some of the other tribes of Israel. But he is set. He will have this Philistine woman. On a visit to her village in verses 5 and 6, he is uh, confronted on the road by a wild, roaring lion. And this is the first of his great physical feats. He actually slays the lion with his bare hands. He leaves the corpse, now having violated his Nazarite vows, and he goes to visit 
the Philistine woman. On the way back, on his way home, he comes across the corpse of the lion. And some bees in its rib cage have made a hive and he reaches in and takes some of the honey that nourishes himself. A double violation of his vow. And then he takes some of the honey home to his parents, thus violating them as well. But the marriage goes on and a great feast is arranged. In those days, a marriage feast lasted seven days. And in the midst of the merrymaking, perhaps in the midst of a boastful toast, uh, Samson challenges all of his soon-to-be Philistine in-laws uh, to solve a riddle. Uh, the, the riddle was uh, related directly to his confrontation uh, with the lion. He says to them, if you can solve this riddle, then I will give you 30 changes of clothes and 30 Uh, clean linen garments. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. They take the bet, but they're not up to the challenge. And so they try a bit of trickery. Uh, The Philistine in-laws go to the Philistine bride And they say, wheedle out of your husband the answer to the riddle, lest we become bankrupt. She goes to Samson and she says, do you love me? Do you really love me? Tell me the answer to the riddle. Oh, no, 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 can't tell you the answer to the riddle. You don't love me after all. You've heard this story before, right? Uh, In the end, he gives in, he tells her the answer. And she reveals the answer to to her kith and kin, and they come to claim the bet. Samson is outraged. He says to them, you would not have known this if you had not plowed with my heifer. It's one of my favorite lines in the whole story. (laughs) He charges out of town, goes to the next village, And he slays 30 men, strips them of their garments, comes back, pays off his bet, and then storms back home. His bride's wife, uh, his bride's father, uh, now, uh, thinking that Samson is gone forever, gives her to another man. And when Samson comes back, he is again outraged. He's been betrayed not once, but now twice. And to take vengeance, he captures 300 foxes. He ties ties torches to their tails. And he sends them scurrying into the freshly harvested grain fields. And the whole harvest is burned up. At that point... The Philistines are outraged, and uh, though they can't take out their rage on Samson, they decide to take it out on that that poor father-in-law who had made a bad choice and his whole family, and the whole family is destroyed. But uh, that wasn't the last of the betrayals. Now, the Philistines are uh, making it burdensome on their captive peoples, the Israelites. And so the sons of Judah come up with 3,000 men, and they confront Samson, saying, essentially, what the children of Israel had said to Moses and Aaron uh, when they were forced to make bricks without straw. You've made trouble for us. Therefore, we're delivering you into the hands of the Philistines. Samson says, all right, but you promise you're not going to attack me, right? They say yes. So they bind him and they take him to deliver him uh, to the Philistines. Uh, But just before he's about to be handed over, he bursts his bonds, grabs the jawbone of a donkey, and the slaughter ensues. 
At the end of the battle, 1,000 men have fallen. In verse 16, Samson sings a song of victory. And here, if we haven't gotten the hint thus far, we see the true heart of Samson. She sings a song of victory saying, I have slain with my own hand a thousand of the enemy. Always beware of saying that you've done something when it was God who did it in the first place. But ironically, the next breath out of Samson's mouth is a cry back to the Lord. Now, admittedly, it's a bit of a complaint. He's thirsty after the battle. And he cries out to the Lord saying, I'm your champion. I'm your hero. I'm going to die of thirst. Really, Lord? Is this the way it's all supposed to end? <laughs> he splits a rock and, and has a drink and, and carries on. Uh, but at this point, we really see the paradox of Samson. He's inordinately gifted. But he thinks that the gifts are him. And he doesn't see the giver of the gifts at all. At this point in chapter 16... Uh, we see the real kryptonite of this superhero, temptresses. In verses 1 to 3, through 3, he goes down to Gaza, to a harlot who is there. The Philistines uh, discover that uh, he is cavorting, and and therefore they set an ambush for him. Uh, But once again, he escapes their grasp, and even rips out the gates and the posts of the city and drags them to the nearest hill. The next scene begins in verse 4 of chapter 16 and goes all the way to verse 22. This is the bewitching allurement and seduction of Delilah. She was a woman from the Sorek Valley, which is uh, that uh, borderline between the land of the Philistines and the land of the Danites. Uh, the Philistines, knowing of Samson's desire for Delilah, come to her and say, we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver if you can wheedle out of Samson the secret of his strength. And once again, Samson is betrayed. It becomes a pattern in his life. Uh, But he doesn't ever seem to learn the lesson. Uh, Delilah uh, seeks to uh, seduce him and ask him, what is the secret of your strength? He says, first, uh, if you were to tie me up with a, a fresh bowstring, my strength would be sapped. So she tells the Philistines... And when they come upon him, he breaks the bowstring and chases them away. Likewise, she comes back. She says, don't you love me? What is the secret of your strength? He says, if you bind me with fresh new ropes, uh, my strength will be sapped. And uh, so she tells the Philistines and they come He breaks his bonds and chases them away. Uh, She says a third time, uh, what is the secret of your strength? He says, you see my Nazarite braids? You take those seven braids and you pin them up and that will sap my strength. All along, he knows he's lying to her. She tells the Philistines, they come. He lets down his hair and he strikes them. Finally, as she says, truly, truly, what is the secret of your strength? And he said, if you will cut off my hair, my strength will be sapped. He falls asleep. She cuts his hair. And all along, Samson still thinks he's just lying. Verse 20 says, I will go out as before. But he does not know that the Lord has left him. And he has no strength. 
And the Philistines come and they capture him. In verses 23 through 31, uh, we see uh, the horrible end of Samson. He's captured. He's blinded. He's enslaved. And finally, in a last gasp, he cries out to the Lord for one final burst of strength. And he pulls down the house. It kills him and all of the Philistines around him. The story of Samson can be read as a cautionary tale. This is the way John Milton read the story in his famous poem, Samson Agonistes. He writes, Tragedy, as it was anciently composed, hath ever been held the gravest, moralist, and most profitable of all other forms of poetry. It uh, has the power of raising pity and fear or terror uh, to purge the mind uh, of those in such like passions uh, that it is to temper and reduce them to just measure with a kind of delight stirred up. In other words, uh, we can look at the story of Samson and, and we realize what we ought not to be and what we ought not to do. Uh, First of all, Samson violated every single one of his vows. Uh, Secondly, uh, Samson mistook his gifts for God's endorsement of him. This is a trap that we can easily fall into, isn't it? Uh, We see someone who is prospering, and we think, oh, that's the blessing of God. Uh, just because the business is growing or uh, the bank account is uh, flourishing or, or the portfolio is, is uh, growing madly or, or the church is, uh, is overflowing in the parking lot and nobody can seem to get out the one skinny little driveway. Uh, if we mistake circumstances for the blessing of God, we may miss the fact that God may just be being patient with us. It's not necessarily an endorsement of us. Third, we might see this as a cautionary tale against the sense of adequacy that we have in our own judgment. You remember what... What Samson told his father and his mother uh, when he laid eyes on the woman of his desire, he said, she is right in my eyes. That's a phrase that, that should send shivers up and down our spine. You remember Eve saying something very similar in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6? The, the tree that that she was forbidden to eat from, uh, looked to be a delight to the eyes. You remember what Absalom said when he received wicked counsel uh, from his worthless friends in 2 Samuel chapter 15? He says, this sounds right. Good counsel for my eyes. Uh, Likewise, uh, Rehoboam in 1 Kings chapter 12 uh, said uh, of similar bad counsel, uh, this seems right in my eyes. Or later on in the book of Judges, in Judges chapter 17 verse 6, we have the great theme of the whole book of Judges. There was no king in Israel. And so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Beware of guiding your sense of right and wrong by what you feel, by what you want, by what you desire, uh, by what has become a passion stirred up in your soul. Uh, That was Samson's problem. It's a great cautionary lesson. A fourth cautionary lesson from Samson's story might simply be his strength. Oh, how we admire strength. How we yearn for strength. But God does not want us to be strong. He wants us to realize that he is our strength. And to be truly strong 
is to rely upon his strength, not ours. Samson thought that his strength was his. Quite the cautionary tale. But if all we see here is a cautionary tale, we'll actually miss the point of the story. See, the truth is is that the story of Samson and his insufficiency should point us to the one true superhero whose sufficiency accomplishes everything that Samson could not. Samson was strong, but he wasn't strong enough. Samson was great, but he wasn't great enough. Samson was a deliverer, but he didn't deliver entirely. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, uh, we're told this. Long ago, that at many times and in not many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed at the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs." Hebrews chapter 2 tells us uh, that Jesus is greater than the angels. In chapter 3, he is greater than Moses. In chapter 4, he's greater than Aaron. In chapter 5, that he is greater than every high priest that comes after Aaron. In chapter 6, that he is greater than Abraham. In chapter 7, he is greater than Melchizedek. That he brings, according to chapter 8, a, a new and better covenant. A, a new and better covenant uh, where the blood of goats and bulls become as worthless as they have ever been. And only the blood of Jesus uh, can cleanse us once and for all, Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, all of the heroes of Hebrews chapter 11 are just guideposts along the way to show us the full sufficiency of the only true hero of the faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, when the book of Hebrews comes to a crescendo in chapter 12, uh, saying, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And the book ends simply by declaring that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13. Samson was strong. Stronger than almost any other man. But that's just not strong enough. Samson had a great calling, but his calling was not sufficient for the task. Samson was a judge. He judged for 20 years, but then he died, and new judges were required. But Jesus Christ, he accomplished everything that Samson could never accomplish. The Nazarite, Samson, failed in all his vows. But the Nazarene, Jesus, fulfilled them all and therefore satisfied everything that Samson ever lived for. John Milton, in his great poem, Samson Agonastes, was actually leaning on an earlier Anglo-Saxon poem about Samson. The uh, Victorian editor of this particular edition 
that concludes by saying this, and so it is that Samson, the mightiest of our kinsmen redeemers, must needs illumine for us the incapacities and the insufficiencies of every human deliverance. Forsooth, the Nazarite would point us to the Nazarene, Jesu Christo, save us. Jesus Christ does save us. And so for all of the cautionary tales, uh, we have this great conclusion. If we were he- to heed all of the wisdom and learn all of the lessons of Samson, we'd still fall short. But because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, that we can now walk robed in his righteousness, strengthened with his strength, uh, delivered by his deliverance, rescued by his great rescue. He is the one true great superhero. Thanks be to God. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.